Karsis Lovatar is one of the four clavigars of Sarcasism. She is often seen as Grand Karsis Ion's favorite concubine. She represents sex, love, eroticism, pleasure, motherhood, disease, and unrestrained reproduction. Upon being impregnated with Ion's spawn, Lovatar burrowed into the earth of the Balkan Peninsula, metamorphosing into a gargantuan form allowing her brood to gestate as she was attended to by her holocaust. Since her 1977 discovery by the SCP Foundation, she has been given the designation SCP-2191-3. We will discuss Karsis Lovatar origin and life according to sacred Sarkic texts. In the previous video we discussed SCP-2191 and its relation to Lovatar. I would recommend watching SCP-2191 first, link in the description. We will first read through the Sarkic texts of her, then later on we'll read a scroll about her in Alexandria Library that further explains her story. The first Sarkic text we have is within the Memoria Aditum Prologue. It's titled, Of Lovatar and the Throne. I will read it verbatim. I go to set the people free. The words of her Ngakamats, her beloved. They were spoken with such quiet determination, fueled by the raging inferno of his anger and backed by the unstoppable force of his will. When they had sat together, all those years ago, when they had talked and debated for days, she had known in her heart that he was right. Their debate had never been about who was right. If it had been that that they had debated, she never would have joined him in the pursuit of his mad dream. No, she knew he had been right almost from the beginning. Rather, they had debated the means by which he could accomplish his vision. The diva had been a blight upon the land. Their cruelty and sadism had been unsustainable from the start, and how quickly they had fallen stood testament to that sad truth. The reality was that in order for the land to flourish, for the people to survive, the diva had to fall. Lovatar stood alone atop the battlement, overlooking the land that Ion had liberated, that he had freed. Wherever he walked, the land had burned with the fires of revolution, and the Davite legions had fallen. Whether by sword, by whisper, or by the sheer force of his will, he had marched the Halkastana across the lands of the diva and returned it to the people. Now here, in the holy city of Adidam, Ion had brought the Halkastana to rest. Here, he would abide for a time. She knew that it would not be for forever, despite the sages' whispering of Kamiktama, the Deathless. It wasn't part of the plan, it wasn't a part of the future that her Ngakamats had foreseen. A surge of impotent rage and sadness threatened to overwhelm her, and she reached out to rest her hand upon the warm surface of the parapet. The fortress palace quivered beneath her at her touch, somehow feeling the depth of her anguish as it rose up within her. She could feel its desire to comfort her, the great leviathan at its heart reaching out to protect and serve. A soft sigh escaped her lips and she gently stroked the bulwark, whispering soothing words to calm the great Kirak. I have made a video about Kirak of Karsus Tundas. I will leave a link in description, now back to the text. She sensed its love, the solid sense of purpose that rippled through its massive bulk as it returned once more to its slumber. She had been wool-gathering, and if the palace had sensed her anguish, then others might have as well. A voice whispered from the shadows that gathered near the entrance to her balcony. It told her it is not yet time to grieve, my lady. And Lovatar looked up to see Sarn step out to greet her. She smiled at the diminutive girl and she bowed her head in respect of the sadness she heard echoed there. Lovatar replied that she knew. There is a part of her that wishes she didn't know, that he hadn't shared that part of his vision with her. She stepped back from the edge and took a seat on the bench that the palace raised for her. Sarn settled to the ground beside the bench, folding her legs beneath her as she did so. The assassin replied, you would not have believed. Not as you do. There is always a price to be paid, my lady. You know that as well as any of us. Lovatar wanted to disagree with the assassin. A flash of indignation at the insinuation was quickly dispelled as she caught the undertone of self-recrimination in the other woman's words. She paused for a moment, 
collecting her thoughts, then sighed in response. She said, of course, you are right. There is always a price. I just wish that. Her words trailed off as she glanced back out across the rolling hills that surrounded the Leviathan. How could she speak of her selfishness to this woman? How could she express the joy she felt when sharing space with her and Gakamats, of sharing herself with him in a way that Sarn would never know? Lovatar continued, You wish that there was a way for you to be with him, even when you remain and he must go forth to battle. Of course she knew. There was little that slipped past the observant little spy, and nothing that slipped past all her eyes and ears. It was her gift, to see all and to know more. She closed her eyes and simply nodded, trying in vain to hide the tears that threatened to fall. The assassin replied, there is still time. The Mechanites are only just now beginning to plant the seeds of doubt in the Karaites, and they have yet to send envoys to Kemet. The people of that ancient land are slow to anger, but they will get there in the end. The assassin held out a slender hand, palm up, before curling it into a fist, and Lovator shook her head. Then the assassin continued, We are anathema to the followers of Mekane. Their hatred of the flesh is a hate I can understand. But it is the magic wielded by the followers of Ta that I think Ion fears the most. Lovatar shook her head and waved her hand in a dismissive gesture to which the assassin replied apologizing. You did not want to speak of politics, my lady. I'm sorry that I broke into your reverie with such. It was Lovatar's turn to shake her head and she said, No, my friend. We each serve in the way that we are best suited. I would not begrudge you the way that service reveals itself. You sought to comfort me, and I appreciate that. She stretched and leaned back onto the bench and said, And you are right. There is still time. The next part of the text is a quote from the Solomon Ari Voxeron titled The Rise of Kaumiktama. It reads and it came to pass in those days that there was peace upon the land. The host of the Ozirmak had taken much of the land of the Davites, and there were none to oppose them. Ion had taken for his seat the city of Aditum, and he dwelt there for a time in prosperity. It was then that a great sadness overwhelmed the Klavigar Lovatar, and she went to Ion, and she begged him for a boon. She said, Take not thy wrath out upon thine enemies. Stay thy hand and dismiss thy righteous fire, for that path leads to suffering and death. And Ion's heart was moved, for he looked upon Lovatar with great affection. He knelt before her and took her into his arms and whispered to her words of comfort. It was such that her heart was still, and though she wept still for the prophecy that was yet to be fulfilled, her resolve was strengthened. For it was in those days that she set about to craft a gift for her lord. For thirty days and thirty nights she labored in great agony, growing forth from her bosom a finely wrought seed of such exquisite beauty that all who gazed upon it marveled. It was then that the Kamiktama celebrated the Feast of Sukanta, as Ion had decreed it would fall upon the anniversary of his liberation of the people. It was on the tenth and final day of that great feast did Lovatar present the fruit of her labor to Ion. She had taken the crafting of her flesh and added to a decoration of the finest lapis lazuli from the kingdom of Kemet, and jade from far away Ombwa. Together with Sarn, she had crafted a soft pillow to adorn its surface, so that Ion would be at ease upon it, and had crafted it from their own raven locks, so that it would continue to live with their love. And Ion looked upon the gift, and his heart was moved again, for he knew what great cost Lovatar had borne in the crafting of such a gift. And he bade the celebrants of the great feast to be still, and he spoke to them of her love. It was then that he decreed that the seat would travel with him, wherever he should go, to always remind him that he led only by the love of those he would lead. That's the end of the first Sarkic text. It's a bit confusing, but the Alexandria Library entry of Lovatar gives us some insights. It reads, As Ion and his Clavigar began spreading their religion worldwide they faced opposition from the Mechanites, and soon a war started between the two factions. During the war Lovatar with assistance of Sarn created out of her body a long shaft of bone, a divan and a footstool as gifts for Ion, and would become holy Sarkic artifacts. However, 
She was eventually defeated along with her fellow Sarkites after Ion was banished. Following the end of the war and the late Bronze Age collapse, Lovatar, Nadox and Sarn waited for Ion's return but as years passed, Lovatar left, trying to find a way to be reunited with the Grand Karsist. The second Sarkic text is titled, Of Lovatar and Liberation, it's part of Act 3 of In Memoria Aditum. As the previous I will read verbatim. It was market day in the city. The streets were bristling with locals and traveling merchants. Smells of cooking fish, baking bread and the crush of humanity filled the air. She wrapped her robes tightly around her as she worked her way through the crowd, wary of her perceived vulnerability as a woman out alone in the market. She stopped by a stall selling shawls and other woven goods, when she noticed a man staring at her from several stalls away. When she made eye contact with him, he turned away to look at the goods on offer. Subtle, she thought. She selected a shawl and held its gentle blues up to the afternoon light. She could feel her observer moving further away, but never out of direct line of sight. She wondered what had caught his attention. She wore the cloaks to hide herself as best she could, but she knew attention from men was often forthcoming, especially when not welcome. There had been a time when she had cultivated such attention, reveled in the way she could manipulate men and women at the court just by a look or an opportune smile. But that had been long ago in another place, another life. Now, she mostly wanted to be left alone. Men, especially in this new age, felt entitled to a woman's body in ways she despised. She set the shawl down and offered the vendor a handful of silver denarii for cloth. She slipped the shawl into her bag and moved down the line of stalls. There were twenty or thirty people between her and the admirer, but she felt his gaze on her back as she turned down another line of stalls. When an alley opened to her left, she ducked down and slipped between the stone buildings. She leapt onto a windowsill and climbed to the roof. She laid on the dusty roof tiles and glanced below to see the man in the cloak dash into the alleyway. His hood came down as he ran, and she saw the telltale gleam of bronze at his eye and neck. Mechanite She pulled herself away from the edge of the rooftop and turned over so she had her face to the sky, feeling the afternoon warmth seeping through her robes. She draped her arm over her eyes and let her thoughts drift off to another time centuries before, when she had left her family behind. He asked her where will she go. She told her brother and lover that she wants to see her homeland again. There is not much left, but the old magic still sings among the rocks. She shall abide there for a time. To which he replied that she will not stay there. Though it may have been the first place she opened her eyes to at her birth, it was never her home. She told him she'd go to her disciple and finish their work on the plan, laying the groundwork for any number of weapons her people could utilize in the coming months and years. She not wanted to leave him in that dark place, but she could not have stayed any longer. If she must mourn, she would do so in the sun and under the stars. She had very little purpose other than waiting for the appointed time for the return. She was in Jerusalem to meet a certain person and had taken her time exploring the city. A city apparently crawling with Mechanite paladins hunting for her. A trio of voices from below her in the alley brought her back to the present with a snap. One of the voices dominated the others, loudly shouting in Latin with a metallic twang to the pronunciation saying, Spread out, my brothers. I saw her come into this alley and I know she's alone. Vulnerable. She told herself, vulnerable, how confident. She watched them separate, the dominant voice heading deeper into the alley on her side while the other two rushed away down a side branch. Careful of where she cast a shadow, she crept along the rooftops of several adjoining stone buildings, always several steps behind her hunter. She thought back to her time before meeting the Ozirmak, and the conflict that came with the politics of court life in Adidam before their revolution. Century after century of violence, either physical or social. And always, she was seen as vulnerable. Because she was beautiful, because she was a woman, 
Only the Ozirmak and Nadox had ever treated her as capable without factoring for the calculus of her gender. The Mechanite was checking each building he came across, peering into windows briefly before moving on. He stopped in front of an open door, a small residence tucked beneath a larger one, with a small stone staircase headed down into the earth. He was sticking his head in to look around the space, and she took the opportunity to leap down behind him. She took several running steps and just as he was turning to look in her direction, she pushed him into the open space. He fell forward, striking his head on a wooden table. She closed the door behind her and latched it. He was stirring, the telltale clicking of brass gears somewhere under the cloak. She stripped out of her robes to just a sleeveless shift she had been wearing underneath. She placed her foot on his back, between his shoulder blades, and pressed down. She bent down and pulled the cloak away from his back, bearing the bronze plates up his neck and across his shoulders. He started to push against the floor, fighting her weight pressed down on his back. She reached around his face, and with a nail slit a shallow cut along the bare skin under his eye. She backed off and watched as he fought, struggling into a seated position with his back against the wall. Fine tremors rippled along his body beyond his control, the wound on his face bled, and his breathing sped up. The tremors built in intensity until he had to hold his legs from visibly shaking. His voice wavered as he asked, What did you do to me, witch? She smiled as he attempted to stand for a few minutes and then gave up, falling back against the wall. He screamed that he cannot move, asking what has she done, to which she replied, You mechanites are so fond of replacing parts of your bodies with brass and steel, but you still need flesh. I am familiar with the ways of flesh. She saw one of his eyes had been replaced with a red gem which partially lit up the dark basement hovel. There were plates of bronze bonded to his face, leaving only small strips of skin exposed. She had slit a thin line just below his natural eye but above the uppermost plate sitting. From the cut small tendrils of flesh were protruding and gripping the bronze plating. She asked, What do you want with me, man of bronze? The soldier replied, You are Lovatar, queen of the abominations. She laughed, saying, I am not a queen of anything. He spit, saying high priestess then. Which? Lovatar replied closer to truth. What do you want from me? To which the soldier answered, Eradication. Burn out the rot at its root. She shook her head, grimacing. His limbs pulled tight, as if lashed to four horses. He gasped in pain. And Syed, why do you Mechanite think so little of us? He coughed. You and your kind. You and your kind are abominations, unnatural. A trickle of blood flowed from his natural eye and mouth. Lovatot replied, We are unnatural. You replace your skin and organs with metal and we are unnatural. Your god is all that is cancerous in this universe. And you are its creatures, its servants on earth. We. Have. No. God. We kill gods, you metal buffoon. She clenched her fist and tendrils exploded from every exposed patch of skin on the mechanite, wrapping themselves around his body. Each left bloody trails across the bronze plates, and the cloak as his limbs were brought in tight against his body. He whimpered as he slid into a supine position. Before she left, she draped a ragged blanket from one of the hovel's beds over his limp but breathing form. Lovatar donned the robes over her slip, pulled them tight against her body, and lifted the hood over her head. She wiped at the few droplets of blood that had marked her face and hands, then slipped down the length of the alley and away from the market. An hour later she found her way to the trades district near the city walls and entered a glass lantern maker's workshop. The last of the afternoon sun was beginning to set beneath the horizon behind her as she entered. An older man from the back of the workshop called out saying, Sorry, miss. If you'll be wanting some custom work done, you'll have to come back in the morning, Lovatar replied I did not intend to buy a lantern from you, but I would if it would lead me to what I want. The man asked, and what would that be? She said I have heard that Jacob, son of Ephraim, works in this shop. The man answered, he does. What do you need of him? 
she continued well, Jacob, I was hoping you would speak to me of the other realm, of the veil which separates the waking world from the gods and even the spirits of the dead. The man replied, There is only one God, the Most High. But what makes you think that I would be the one to inform you? She said, I have heard of your knowledge of that art called Kabbalah, mapping the ethers and the face of God. The man confirmed, saying, I have studied the texts. The Lovatar asked, Have you heard the term, never meant? He froze, his eyes wide. She continued, Please, I ask because someone I love very much has become lost in its seas. His face softened, saying, Then your loved one is almost certainly lost. She insisted, saying, They are made of stern metal. Let us assume the experience would not have destroyed them. What would it take to pull them back to the waking world? He began to speak and did not stop until many hours had passed, and the sun had long set. When she left, her tutor well paid and her curiosity sated, she returned to her rented room. She had not finished writing her letter to Nadox until the sun rose again in the morning. She woke with a start, even the light silk slip covering her body stifling in the summer heat. Lovatar stood from the bed and went to the intricate enameled shutters hanging over the bed. She tossed the shutters open and let the breeze from the Lycus River below flow into the room. The apartment was situated high in the noble district of the city, overlooking the river. Behind her, there was stirring in the bed. She leaned on the windowsill, letting the air flow through her slip and hair, cooling the sweat on her skin. She looked at the Byzantine noblemen in the bed, slowly waking from their joint mid-morning nap. One eye opened and looked toward her form, backlit from the summer sun. Vest Asilean Spartanos yawned and smiled at her. She wondered again why she was here. Hello, my darling, he said. Lovatar replied, dear Vest, you look liable to fall back asleep and waste away the day. Is this what the noble court Vests do in the great Byzantine Empire? Sleep away during the daylight hours. Vest replied, my duties are mostly diplomatic and bureaucratic but it's not my sloth that keeps me to this bed, my dear. If you were not so energetic in our lovemaking, I might have spare energy. But, alas, I must reserve my strength to satisfy your passions. She smirked. That you only barely do, she thought. She bent to the table below the windowsill and poured herself some wine from the dwindling carafe. He asked, Will you pour me one as well, my love? She had never claimed to love him. She loved very few, and certainly not someone so vapid as this. But he was pleasant to look at and pleasant to sleep next to, so she did not correct his misapprehension. She poured him the last of the wine in another goblet and carried it to him in the bed. He is no ion. Lovatar said, Asilean, you know I cannot stay forever. When will you introduce me to the chief of the palace? My family expects me back in another month, which means I should leave soon. You said he was your uncle, and that you could introduce me. Vess replied, My uncle is the Karapolates, it's true. He is my mother's brother, and he is very fond of me, as he has no children of his own. And I will, Serena. I keep my promises. She scoffed and turned back to the window. The white walls of the luxurious apartment were cleaned daily by servants, who brought the Vest his wine and food while he was at home. Vest continued, Don't be mad, my sweet. And don't go running off, back to the darker alleyways of Paris, stay here with me. She shook her head without turning back to him. Paris. She had not seen Paris in nearly a century. She was just sick of this city, and its Christian oligarchical nonsense. Better to go back to Prague and see Nadox, this endless wandering was going to eat her alive. She had no home just a series of luxurious apartments in European cities, men trying to bed her, and no purpose. She had told him that she was from Paris, that she came from a noble Frankish family, and that her name was Serena. He thought of her as some petulant child, no doubt. She looked to be nineteen years old, as it did her well to let men underestimate her. Serena, did you hear me? Vest asked. She turned to look at him, saying, yes. I heard you. But what I heard was sweet nothings about my staying in this city and becoming your whore. 
while you failed to produce an introduction as promised. He stared at her, but she turned back to the river and drank more of the wine. Why had she ever let him think she was seduced? She was so bored. Why bother to couple with anyone who was not a clavigar or ion? She grinned when she thought that the only other person with her perspective on time outside of her extended family was Bumero, but then, he would not find that so funny. His hands found her bare shoulders and his lips found her neck. He cooed at her like a lost puppy, as he turned her face to his for a kiss. She let him. I could eat you alive. And yet, because I am a woman, you treat me as your property already owned. Vest whispered to Lovatar, I do not want you to be my whore. I love you. Be my wife. Think of the prestige your family would earn. And think of the trading contracts for your father. Besides, I would provide for your every desire. God's blood, but he likes to hear himself talk. Then she replied, Convince me, Asalean. Introduce me to your uncle and show me you actually have the connections you have promised for a week. He replied, Tomorrow, there's a function at the palace, I can introduce you then. I was going to invite you anyway. She turned and smiled at him, willing the annoyance to leave her face, and thanked him. He patted the bed and she walked over, leaned over him and whispered in his ear. Food. He laughed and rang the bell for his servants. The palace of Blitcherny was crowded with Emperor Theodore Lascaris supplicants and family. Lascaris was first emperor of this new state, Nicaea, but for all intents and purposes it was Byzantium. Lovatar had been here centuries before, and the pomp, the affluence, the blind arrogance was the same. Much like her home in Aditum, before the Ozirmach came. Brilliant opulence almost completely unfettered by any limitations. Asalayan took her arm, wrapping it around his own and insisted on introducing her to three or four functionaries before finally taking her to the refreshments. He said to her, My uncle is hosting a series of visitors. We just need to wait a little while. She nodded absent-mindedly as she took a goblet of wine from his outstretched hand. At least the wine and food at such functions were usually superb. But then, thoughts of the celebrations upon the establishment of an additum free of diva rule brought up memories unwelcome. Ion had been gone for nearly 1,500 years, and she had left Nadox only a century later. Except for the occasional letter sent his way, she had only spoken with him twice in that span of time. He was busy with his machinations and the revolution of his flesh, but she wondered if he missed her. She certainly missed him. And of course, Sion. But what she missed most was purpose. She had come to Constantinople for one reason, to establish inroads for her brother's agents, such that trade and supplies could be ensured for the scattered tribe of the Nalka. If the plan was to continue to unfold, she was sure support from an imperial power would be beneficial. She'd not informed Nadox or her disciple of this plan. It was born out of frustration. So much time, so little purpose. Her great work was already accomplished, and yet not completed until all the moving parts came together. Asalayan interrupted her thoughts saying, A duty to wait. Asalayan touched the small of her back. She looked at him and smiled. He breezed her around the palace banquet halls, introducing her to dozens of petitioners of various noble stations. She remembered very few of the names, as she guessed Asalayan was showing her off. A woman as property. A concept that was still so alien to her, being raised as a diva and then in the freed aditum. She hated this new world. Even if she did not need Ion back by her side, she would have waited for the plan if only to reset society back to equal footing for all individuals no matter what gender they identified with. Asalayan said, My uncle is ready for us. That's his manservant over there. She nodded, following him away from the gathering and into an antechamber with a very well-dressed older man surrounded by retinue. The older man took her hand in his and kissed it. Then said, ah, so this is the lovely Serena my nephew has been telling me about. Lovatar replied, I'm pleased to meet you, my lord. To which he replied, 
and I you, Lady Clavigar. She froze, his hand still gripping hers tightly. She pulled her hand from his and turned away just in time to see Asalean darting from the room. Betrayed, made a fool of. Damn him. She turned, her nails extending and the veins in her arms bulging as her system flooded with adrenaline, her will asserting control over the flesh. The uncle interrupted her saying, Now, Lovatar, none of that. Vents opened in the floor in a rough square formation around her and flames as tall as she rose from the openings. He continued, I would like to speak to you before the holy inquisitors come for you, but first, the older man looked to his side and nodded to a subordinate. She felt the floor give way and she was suddenly in a cage too narrow for her to lay down in. The metal was hot from the flames and scalded her skin. She cried out as the topmost layer of skin burned in parallel to the bars. The cage was lowered and then pulled horizontally until placed over a shaft before being dropped like a stone. As resilient as she was, she still lost consciousness at the impact. Two weeks they had interrogated her, caged in a heated cell such that her skin blackened and crisped but never such that she would die. Any normal person would have perished after the first day of this mechanite torture, but she was Clavigar. What mattered was that her host promised Bumaru's inquisitors would arrive any day and begin their trial, all because she was an abomination. She grabbed the bars of her cell and pulled with all her might, but the heat burnt the palms of her hands and forced her to release her grip. She was weak from lack of sleep and minimal food. Her Hawkos regeneration prevented her body from taking too much damage, but as the burning was constant, she could feel her strength waning. She drifted, not asleep but not fully awake until she heard a clanging metal sound and the metal started to cool. She looked up and saw the guard with two individuals staring at her, the cage door open. The guard whose halberd pointed at her chest, he said, My master bids you be careful, she is not to be underestimated. The two individuals looked modified, with brass and steel parts covering much of their bodies. One of them had a bronze grill instead of a mouth. His voice was metallic and distorted. The other man yelled, Know your place, guard. Do not speak down to the Chosen. Now bind her. The guard pressed the halberd lightly against her chest, just enough so that the heated point burned her breast through her ragged robes. Distracted as she was by the searing pain, she barely felt the manacle shut around her wrists and ankles. She was roughly pulled to her feet and half dragged out of the cell. The two inquisitors glared down at her as she was hauled into another cell and bound to a torture device. Her arms were bound to iron manacles held above her head, her back arched on a rounded drum of some sort, and her ankles bound again but spread such that she could not quite find her purchase. The Inquisitors glowered at her from across the room for several minutes as they spoke softly to one another. Then one of them stooped over her as the other circled behind the device. The one in front of her spoke, You will tell us where your fellow Clavigar's domicile, and you will tell us quickly, which... She could feel the spittle from his mouth as he growled the words. The one with the grill instead of a mouth stood slightly behind the machine and began to circle to the mechanical apparatus stationed on her right side. As he passed, she extended her fingers as far as they could go and forced her ailing body to grow her nails. She almost missed him, but she felt the nail on her index finger glance off the bronze armor bonded over his loins. She could feel the flesh underneath the armor, pulsing with blood. He started to back away but she pushed with all her might. Dislocating the wrist in the process she plunged first one nail, and then three, through the armor and dug into the space behind his manhood. He gasped, bending over. The other looked up in alarm but was too late to do anything as she absorbed the grill-mouthed inquisitor's flesh into her being and felt the strength returning, the burns closing. The inquisitor that had bent over her pulled a short sword, but she had already ripped her way loose from the manacles. Lovatar sank fingers into his eyes to the knuckles. She felt his brains leak out as she withdrew her nails. Both inquisitors sunk to the floor, dead or dying. 
She ripped the manacles around her ankles free from the torture device and pulled her robes across her healing body. Lovatar strode from the torture chamber on bare feet, the manacles clanging against stone with every step. Guards fell once they were within a stone's throw of her, as her hawkos began producing one virulent plague after another. If they were enhanced mechanites, she slipped within their guards to cut out their hearts, punching through armor and cloth like it was paper. She had taken daggers from two of the guards and had to defend against a few feeble attacks. But they were flesh under their modifications. She walked out of the prison's front entrance and saw the man who had captured her trying to saddle a horse, casting panicked glances back towards her. She let one of the daggers fly, puncturing his left thigh. He shrieked as she bent over his shuddering body. She said in cold eyes, if I had the time or the inclination, I would have liked to set you on fire, my host. Let the last fiery moments of your life be a willing testament to the lack of respect you showed a clavigar. She pulled the knife from his thigh and he screamed. Then she continued, but I do not have the time, so take my gift. The gift of eternal life, from one who served at the right hand of the Ozirmak. You do not deserve it and I hope it gives you much pain. She walked down the dirt road along the front of the prison. His screams intensified behind her as his body expanded and contorted to allow for the added mass and new tissues. Before she had walked to the end of the road and turned a corner around the walls of the prison, he had begun tearing up chunks of the street and buildings with his great red paws. Protrusions caught fleeing guards and prisoners alike and pulled them into his maw. She could still hear their cries as she made her way to the city gate. She left Constantinople that very moment, bedraggled and dressed in rags once meant to impress the imperial family. And yet, despite the pain she had endured, Lovatar smiled. Lucian, once Calacaran, placed a bowl in front of her. She sat at the head of a large dining table in his opulent manner. He sat adjacent to her on the right. He said to her, I hope you like it. I tried my best to recreate Clergit. She dipped the spoon into the broth and brought it to her lips. She smiled. Yes, it is very close. Thank you. The soup had a similarity to borscht but with a coppery aftertaste, no doubt due to the inclusion of blood when making the stock. There were other subtle differences to the original dish, but she was touched by his attempt to make her feel welcome. He sipped at his wine and took some small spoonfuls of the broth into his mouth. He dabbed his lips and spoke again, saying, It's been almost ten years since I saw you last. What have you been doing, master? She picked up the glass of wine in front of her and raised it to him in a silent toast. He did the same. It was rich, sweet, and complicated, like her feelings being in his company again. Lovatar answered, I have been wandering mostly, studying some of the occult, experimenting with some of the outlying Nalka communities, and experiencing the world. I even went to America for a short while. He replied, Ah, America, they seem rather brash there. She laughed, saying, They are. But they're young. Also troubling. How so? the man asked. She answered, there are men there organizing, in partnership with those in England, who would study the occult. And if they discover something, they lock it away. Hide it from the normal humans. I think they could be trouble for our people eventually. The man exclaimed, saying, from an ocean away. Lovatar continued, do not forget the Darkwater Lodge and Natal family are effectively in Louisiana, not an ocean away. Besides, the world is smaller than it was, a month at sea and one can cross the Atlantic. We had best keep an eye on this American Secure Containment Initiative. The man agreed saying, I'll pass the word along, I'm sure the others will have made note. But I apologize if this is too forward of me. You seem unwell. Lovatar replied, Are you saying I look tired, Lucian? She looked at him from the corner of her eye as she sipped more of the broth. He laughed saying, No, that is not what I meant. You look stunning as always. 
I mean to say, you seem not yourself. She asked, and what is this self I do not seem like? Lucian replied driven, passionate, a leader. She raised her voice slightly saying, who am I to lead? Where is my army? Where is my part of the plan? Ah yes, it is fulfilled. I merely wait. More than two thousand years I have been waiting. Lucian interrupted her saying, Ion surely knew. She continued, Oh, certainly they knew how long they would be absent. And I think Nadox knew. But all I was aware of was it would be a long time. Waiting for more than twenty centuries is quite long enough, don't you think? She tossed the spoon into the bowl with a splash. Lucian tried to calm her. She continued, No, Lucian, listen. Do not adopt this modern man's worldview of women with me. I was a diva and then I was Clavigar, long before the Christ was born. We have watched Rome and Byzantium and a dozen other empires crumble. If you speak to me as women are spoken to in polite society, I will take your tongue. He was silent for a time and then got up to retrieve the bottle of wine from the mantel. He poured her another glass as he spoke and apologized. Lovatar replied, No, I should apologize. I hate the way society has shaped its view of my sex. I have wandered this modern society watching each wave of modernity improve the technical aspects of life and barely touch the social. To know that every handsome cab driver that sneers at me or is a touch too lecherous, I could end in the space of a breath. It's not enough to have power if society treats you like you do not. Lucian replied, You seem lost, my lady. She asked, What am I here for? Just to wait for Ion. I want to be doing something worthwhile. Lucian said, trying to change the conversation, Well, even if the great plan did not factor in for your necessity, I could certainly use your guidance. She asked, About what? Lucian explained, Love for one but the work as well. Lovatar answered, Love, what do I know about love? The loves of my life are spread around the globe and beyond. I have not seen them for hundreds of years. Sarn is the only one that checks in on me. Orok is buried under his temple, and Nadox has imprisoned himself in his cloister. Me, I wander. Love is a wistful memory, Lucian. I have obligations. He looked uncomfortable, then apologized again. Lovatar continued, I will wait for the appointed time. I will act when it is my time to act, but despair is my constant companion. All I can hope is that when the Ozumak returns, they have some purpose for my life. For I have failed in finding one of my own. Then, let us talk about the work. They spoke deep into the night about the work he was doing with the carrier organism they had created so long ago. They had made a disease so devastating that it could wipe out most of the world in months. But Lucian had ideas to use the work as a basis for other things, intoxicants, the basis of stem growth in Nalka soldiers, and the foundation of whole new forms of life. Before he went off to bed, he warned her that she had caused a stir in the manner of her travel. Forces watched him, even if they could not do anything about it. He was afraid the fire of this attention would burn her as well. She reassured him, she had been burned many times before and had grown calluses. She sat by a fire in his manor's library with some brandy and an open book, but she wasn't reading. Lovatar stared at the crackling fire and sipped at the brandy. She wore a man's riding pants and blouse tucked in, but she had cast aside her boots and riding jacket. Suddenly, one of Lucian's servants burst into the room panting. Where is Mr. Dutois, madam? In his bedroom, she believed. But he was already gone, racing up the stairs. She shook her head at his rudeness and sipped more brandy. A moment later she heard the pounding of someone descending the same stairs rapidly. Lucian approached her in his bed clothes and dressing gown. He said, we have company. We need to leave this place. She asked, what is it? Lucian shouted, Mechanites, an entire squad of them, surrounding the villa. Lovatar asked, and were these the forces watching you, Lucian, or the ones that were following me? Lucian inquired. She continued, 
Oh yes, at least since Paris. I thought they would spring a trap on the road, but then I made it to your manor without incident. Lushim replied, possibly they were intimidated by you. She said, it never stopped their lunacy before. I told you about Constantinople, yes? He nodded saying, well, come then, let's get you out of here. She pulled her boots on and picked up her riding jacket. Asked him to lead the way. He ran back to his room, pulled on some clothes while she waited and then she followed him through a series of hidden panels in the walls. He led her down a hallway that led to the stables, reaching for a door when the wall of the manor caved in. He tried to leap back but a metal gauntlet fist struck him in the right temple, sending him to the floor. Lovatar kept her grip on Lucian's forearm as he fell, twisting so she forcibly dragged his unconscious form away from the melee. She bent to pick up Lucian's dagger and turned towards their attacker. She was nearly eight feet tall, covered head to toe in hardened armor plating. Even the space for her eyes was crisscrossed with mesh. The plates sat on top of one another, slightly offset, so each step or movement created these quiet, slipping sounds as well-oiled plates moved against one another. When her voice came, it was cavernous and metallic with an underlying lyrical tone that made Lovatar think the woman had once had a beautiful singing voice. The voice said, My coterie will not interfere. The perimeter is being maintained, but you are mine, Clavigar. Lovatar stripped out of the riding jacket and held the knife towards her assailant. The voice continued, You have nothing to say, which? Lovatar replied, Talking with you zealots is always a waste of my time. Say your piece and then I'll kill you. The towering woman laughed. It was a very unpleasant sound with so much of her inner workings being converted to machinery. The woman asked, Are you so sure you'll kill me? Lovatar shouted, Enough posturing, you plate mailed idiot. Lovatar lunged, driving the dagger into one of the mesh-covered eye holes in the woman's armor. The mesh caught the blade and prevented it from penetrating more than a finger's width. The mechanite reached up, grabbed the wrist holding the blade, and wrenched it away from her face. Lovatar felt the bone snap in the forearm the giant had grasped. She gasped in pain as the mechanite dropped her onto the floor. The woman then said, so confident and yet you attack with a knife? Look at me, you abomination. You thought a dagger would suffice. Lovatar stood, bracing herself against the wall, and then passed the blade to her good hand. She was amazed she hadn't lost it. The bone in her right arm was setting and fusing, the muscle rippling under the skin. It was extremely painful. The giant mechanite extended a shimmering steel blade from the back of her gauntlet right hand. At its full length, the blade was equivalent to a gladius. The giantess held her feet wide and beckoned the clavigar forward. The muscles along Lovatar's arms, legs and back bulged, adding mass. Her riding pants strained, the seams split along her thighs. She approached the mechanite carefully and fainted with the knife. The giant parried with the wrist Gladius but instead of backing away, Lovatar plunged forward and gripped the right forearm of her assailant. She pivoted, heaved and added her strength to the giant's momentum, causing her to stumble into the corridor wall. The mechanite's shimmering blade sunk into the plaster, blackened from the heat coming off the weapon. The giant howled and ripped her sword from the plaster, showering the unconscious Lucien and Lovatar with debris. She leveled the blade at Lovatar, and it burst from her wrist with the force of a gun. The clavigar did not have the time to dodge so she twisted such that the blade struck her in the right shoulder. She screamed as the blade plunged into her flesh, cutting tendons and shattering bones. She dropped the knife and grasped the blade, gripping the cable that trailed from the weapon to the giant's wrist. The mechanite tried to reel the weapon back to herself, but Lovatar held it firm ignoring the burning crackling sensation. The giant growled and whipped her arm, yanking the blade free of Lovatar and reeling it back in. The cable slid into some unseen cavity in her gargantuan arm as the weapon locked into place. The mechanite then said, Now, I will say my piece. You have haunted our order since the war, making no effort to hide yourself in your wanderings, poisoning the world with your flesh magics. I will take your life. 
I will not prolong this experience, but I cannot wait. The Mechanite interrupted her rant with a visceral scream reverberating out of her metal throat. Lovatar stood, her left hand over the wound in her right shoulder, feeling the bones and cartilage reconnect. The wound still bled, the burnt flesh resisted knitting together, but she barely paid heed to the discomfort. The Mechanite was on her knees, clutching at her right arm. The banded metal plates that covered her arm bulged first at the wrist, and then continued up to her shoulder. The banding bent and split, pushed open by the roiling flesh of the arm. What is this? The giantess growled. The end of you, Lovatar replied. The armor plating had almost entirely separated from the Mechanite's arm. The flesh expanded and rippled, extruding tendrils to several dozen points on her body. The tendrils ripped at the armor plating, causing various shallow wounds across her form. Finally, the bulging bands around her shoulder and down into her chest burst open, spraying Lovatar with the Mechanite's blood. The giantess shuddered and slumped down onto the floor, a pool of blood spreading beneath her. Lovatar bent over the form and said, If you survive this, remember that you labeled us abominations. I will gladly paint myself in your blood to lay claim to the title. She walked back to Lucian and picked him up with her good arm, turning to the gaping hole in the wall that led to the stables. She put her disciple over a horse and tied the reins to her own mount. She cinched her riding jacket close against the cold and urged the horse forward. They only encountered one Mechanite leaving the property. The man took one wide-eyed look at Lovatar covered in the giant's blood and turned away without offering resistance. She continued on for several miles and once she was sure they were not followed, rented a room at an inn in the city. In the night, as she watched over the closest thing she had to a child, praying that he would wake, a grim thought took hold in her mind. I will fulfill my obligation. I will return Ion to the waking world. But I will no longer be a cat's ball. Ion shall grant me the purpose I crave in reshaping this world, or if he does not, I will plot my own course. That's the end of the Sarkic text. To make things more clear we reached for the Keeper of the Lore in Alexandria Library. He had this to say of Lovatar. Unlike most Sarkites, she was originally the most beautiful daughter of a powerful Dev matriarch, named the Blood Empress, and thus opposed to the Grand Karsist and his cause. Her hatred for the Grand Karsist eventually became a sort of infatuation and she wanted to capture, bind and turn him into her personal consort. She sent countless slave hunters to capture Ion, but none returned. Some time later the Grand Karsus himself came to her, meeting Lovatar in the bedchamber. But instead of attacking her, he spoke quietly to her, what about is not known, as legend claims that his words were only meant for her, thus never recorded. Over the next twelve days the two formed a union of sorts and Lovatar became the Grand Karsist's favorite concubine. Fellow Clavigar, Orak, was at first distrustful of her, but after seeing her sincerity he came to accept her. Lovatar would also take under her wing Karsus Lucien Dutois. As Ion and his Clavigar began spreading their religion worldwide they faced opposition from the Mechanites, and soon a war started between the two factions. During the war Lovatar with assistance of Sarn created out of her body a long shaft of bone, a divan and a footstool as gifts for Ion, and would become holy Sarkic artifacts. However, she was eventually defeated along with her fellow Sarkites after Ion was banished. Following the end of the war and the late Bronze Age collapse, Lovatar, Nadox and Sarn waited for Ion's return but as years passed, Lovatar left, trying to find a way to be reunited with the Grand Karsist. Around 205 C, Lovatar went to Jerusalem to find a Jewish mystic who possibly possessed knowledge about the dimension where Ion had been lost. While there, she was attacked by a group of Mechanites, but made quick work of them, and proceeded to meet with the mystic known as Jacob and explain to her the nature of the Neverment. In 1271, Lovatar had arrived to Constantinople of the Byzantine Empire where she took the identity of Serena from France and entered a false relationship with Vest's Asileian Spartanos. 
hoping to establish a trading agreement with the ruling families in order to take care of the scattered Sarkites. However, when Asileian introduced her to his uncle who was a Karapolites, it was soon revealed to have been a setup and they imprisoned Lovatar inside a cage hovering over flames. Fortunately for her, when the Mechanite Inquisitors arrived to torture her, she absorbed the flesh of one of them to regain her strength before killing most of them, except for one whom she transformed into an immortal monster. In 1851, Lovatar began living within Lucian's villa in Portugal, but during her stay they were attacked by a number of Mechanites. Lovatar confronted the leader, a heavily modified enormous Mechanite woman who attempted to end the Clavigar for good only for her to be killed by her. Lovatar and Lucian fled and continued their work in the re-emergence of their religion. Lovatar then would beg Ion to bear his children, which he granted and impregnated her. Filled with joy, she would then be buried under the earth, in an area which would later become the Balkan Peninsula, waiting for the right time to give birth to Ion's brood. Lovatar had remained under the earth till this very day. Losing her human form and becoming a massive subterranean organism with root-like appendages, whose core is located under a temple complex located within the dense Hoya forest of Romania. This form is currently known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2191-3. Lovatar needed human blood in order to keep herself and her offspring alive which led to her deploying a nocturnal species of vampire-like predators to capture humans and drain them of their blood. Her bloodlust was also known to be extinguished by local protosarchic cults via human sacrifices. It was predicted that at some point in the near future she would give birth to gods. If she didn't get regular blood, she would become violent and cause earthquakes with her root-like appendages, leading to massive devastation. The area of effect appeared to be at least 660,000 square kilometers, and put the entire Balkan Peninsula in danger. In the 20th century alone over 40,000 people were known to have died due to this. Because of this, the SCP Foundation had decided to allow the sacrifices, believing it to be the lesser of two evils, despite knowing this helped Lovatars, and in turn Ion's grand plan. As sarcasm began rising once again, with the adherents of the faith disposing of various heads of influential states and groups of interest which was designated SCP-4273, Carsis Lucian Dutua, Carsis Helena Eva, Carsis Young Sun Ban, and Numun broke inside the site containing SCP-3911-1, Lovatar's gift to Ion. They proceeded to use it as part of a summoning ritual. This ritual resulted in the manifestation of the four Clavigar before Ion himself manifested, having finally returned to Earth. Following the incident, the Sarkites began planning the next steps in their plan of taking down their enemies and taking over the world. Following the success of the cross-testing of anomalies at Site 100, SCP-2191 was cross-tested with SCP-4812-S. From this encounter the vampiric SCP-2191-1 tried to steal the nutrients from the creature but were all killed due to SCP-4812-S properties. Lovatar then went on to engulf SCP-4812-S but this also resulted in the being killing her unborn children. As a Clavigar, Lovatar was granted by Ion great power over flesh. She could give birth to various broods became biologically immortal and could shape his body to various extents. She grew to an immense size and rooted deep beneath the ground where she would create various creatures such as vampiric humanoids designated SCP-2191-1, also known as SCBIO type 003 organisms, and vermiform organisms designated SCP-2191-2 that varied in shape and purpose. The humanoids served to gather blood from their victims through SCP-2191-2A and feed Lovatar through SCP-2191-2B and SCP-2191-2C. If Lovatar was not fed then she would cause earthquakes that could destroy various parts of Balkan Peninsula. Lovatar was often depicted as a beautiful and voluptuous woman. She was depicted as nude save for golden ornaments such as a headdress necklaces and bangles, and possessing claw-like fingers and toes and a pair of horns which could be part of her headdress. 
As SCP-2191-3 she is described as a massive organism with root-like appendages extending to an area of approximately 660,000 square kilometers. As a priestess from the Diva Elite she appeared to have been rather spoiled and arrogant, seeing Grand Karsus Ion as a threat to her very way of life. Despite this, after meeting him he showed her the true nature of the gods and convinced her to join his cause, becoming a devout follower of sarcasism. She, just like her fellow Clavigar, was extremely loyal to Ion, shared a deep bond between all five of them, and would do anything to execute every wish of Ion. She so dearly loved Ion that she even wanted to be impregnated by him and birth his children.